Okay, it's six o'clock, so welcome everybody. Um, this is uh, a part of our book talk series, the author's talks, and our author for tonight is Patrice Darrington. Her book, Built Up, A Historical Perspective on Contemporary Principles and Practice of Real Estate Development, and I'm going to, whoops, hold the book up for you here. Um, I will show it a few more times. You see the cover uh, on our webpage, and you see the um, heft of the book uh, in, um, in, in real life. Uh, the, the, um, the book has a, a case is, excuse me, the book has a textbook quality to it and it has a contemporary focus um, in a relevance for real estate education and real estate practice. Um, the launch of the book in a, another slide that I'm going to show you um, now before I introduce uh, Patrice with her credentials, as well as our um, commentating speaker, Jamie Von Klemper, and I'll give you the framing of uh, the evening and then invite Jamie onto the screen so that he can talk more um, about both the book and the practice of design for real estate development. But the, um, the book was published last fall, um, and it was uh, celebrated in a, 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 long, a day long symposium at Columbia in the uh, GSAP, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, where Patrice heads the real estate program. And uh, a six hour symposium with multiple 10 or so contributors in fields that span from real estate development and practice to um, sort of business school economics to urban geographers uh, to, um, to Richard Florida, for example, who was um, one of the co-hosts, considered the book in its many contemporary dimensions um, and praised the book for its history. And as you can see from the cover, there's a pairing of both contemporary and history where the etching represents uh, Covent Garden. And because in this long um, and extremely interesting symposium, uh, which you can find by Googling valuing the city and finding on YouTube uh, this uh, e expansive discussion of the book, uh, because within those six hours of times, um, history was praised, but it wasn't considered in detail. I asked Patrice to tonight to talk about the orange, origins of the book and the origins of commercial real estate development, where she locates them in her scholarship in the early 17th century and with the particular example of Covent Garden. And she's going to do that for us tonight in just a few minutes, um, but also framing the conversation of, about design and commercial development is um, architect Jamie Von Klemper, um, who is happens to be the chairman of the Skyscraper Museum um, and also the president of KPF, also the architect for the skyscraper that you see on the cover of Patrice's book, uh, One Vanderbilt, and uh, someone who has practiced around the world um, in many countries, but uh, with master planning principles very similar to Covent Garden. And in fact, KPF is doing the reworking for the, the current developer of, of Covent Garden um, to bring that uh, 17th century and continuing historical project up into the 21st century. So there are many parallels in, um, in, in Jamie's experience to Patrice's principles and historical examples. Um, so I'm going to try to get out of the way now as, as um, quickly as possible and let Jamie take over to, to frame. But let me um, read some of Padre Patrice's um, background and credentials for you so that she has um, a proper introduction. So Patrice Darrington is the holiday associate professor and director of the real estate program um, at Columbia in the Graduate School of Architecture Planning Preservation. Prior to that, she taught for three years at NYU's Schaaf Institute of Real Estate. Patrice bridges the fields of education and real estate and brings significant global experience as an executive and a board director to numerous property companies um, and to the critical task of educating students and integrating academia and industry. 
A recipient of the prestigious Harkness Fellowship, Daring uh, Patrice studied for her PhD in architecture and engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, then she added an MBA from the Harvard Business School um, to her credentials, and she holds a, a Bachelor's of Architecture uh, from, um, sit, from uh, University of Queensland. Um, she is an Aussie, as the, you, you will hear from her accent. Her teaching career began at Carnegie Mellon uh, and also at MIT, and she spent over 12 years in the real estate industry on Wall Street, where she worked as an investment banker and advisor to institutional clients. So you can see how bringing together academia and her research, which was on, on these early English uh, speculative developers, um, is informed by her understanding of um, current real estate practice. Um, so with that introduction, let me hand it over to Jamie Von Klemper and leave the screen myself um, as um, Jamie takes over the discussion. Yeah, th thank you, Carol, and, and welcome everybody to this evening. And a, a nod to Carol, the, I think the relevance of this topic to uh, Skyscraper Museum, which Carol heads and is, is uh, the sort of the leading spirit of and has been uh, since its inception, uh, is really a, 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 a way to think about urban density. Of course, the tower being the, the densest form of urban workplace, habitation, et cetera. And so the, the issue of how development uh, mechanics work and real estate law, et cetera, uh, is, is hugely relevant to the topic that Carol has made her academic work and her work uh, at the Skyscraper Museum. So um, now I'll just say a few words uh, about what we hope to hear from Patrice and about the importance of this book. Uh, full disclosure, um, my colleagues and I have been teaching up at Columbia this semester uh, in Patrice's program uh, in uh, master's real estate uh, development and just finished our, our last uh, lecture today on the value of design. And so the students are very excited uh, and are excited about the, the topics of your book and they underlie so much of what we all do in practice uh, for me as an architect, for others in the audience who are in various guises of real estate uh, development or uh, other aspects of city, making cities happen uh, and managing cities and, and, and adding to cities. So, um, it's, it's such a vast topic that uh, Patrice has, has masterfully taken on. Uh, it's really a history, it's, it's a philosophy. Uh, we could say uh, it is, uh, if there's such a thing, uh, it's a book about the philosophy of development, about uh, land law, about uh, land economics, about land use, about shaping the land. It's about architecture and zoning. And it's also about stewardship. Uh, in the environment and how uh, buildings and the way the cities grow uh, answer to the need that are external to the immediate needs of any given uh, building use. So uh, the case of Covent Garden happens also to be quite close to, uh, in, in my own practice, our office, which is in Covent Garden uh, on Langley Street. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in her book, we will see uh, if you have a chance to read it, and it is very engrossing. Uh, it's, it's, it's dense in a good sense, uh, rich with, uh, with uh, well-researched information and allusions and, and references and stories, uh, but we'll, you, you'll see references to thinking of Plato, of John Locke, of Adam Smith, of Karl Marx, Robert Moses. So it's really going back to first principles. And one of the things that I appreciate most about the book is very evident in its cover, where you will see Covent Garden as I suppose the Earl of Bedford, we'll hear more about that, had envisioned it or, 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 or realized it, but it also features a building that Essel Green, Mark Holiday and company have finished just in the, in the last month. So the old and the new brought together, uh, there is a great relevance to this topic uh, today. And, and that's what I hope we'll have a chance to both hear from Patrice and talk a little bit about after she has her chance to explain a little bit about the content of the book. So to start us off, I will just read the first part of a paragraph of the book and then hand it over to Patrice. It's a provocative paragraph. So speculative private development is now responsible for delivering the larger proportion of the global urban built environment. 
even within state-ruled countries. But unchecked, it is also held to be responsible for the tragic displacement of communities, unaffordability of housing, controversial additions to the city, typo uh, typography, and the increasing inequality of society. Private developers are typecast as brutal and greedy. Now the rest of the book presents a balanced view of the benefits of uh, the kind of uh, law and practice of private development that uh, that's chronicled in its pages. Uh, and so let's hear about it now from Patrice. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, thank you for having me. And uh, I look forward to this being a discussion. Uh, so folks, do feel as though you can just chime in and, and ask for uh, details. And certainly Jamie's going to open it up to a real discussion uh, dynamic at the end. Uh, I'm going to share the screen so that I can uh, use this, uh, these slides as you know, the eternal PowerPoint that we've become so used to on Zoom. This is the story of the earliest entrepreneurs. And, Carol, Carol and Jamie both said, you know, it's, it's a question as to why Patrice bothered with this book. And um, yes, why, why, why would we bother looking? We all think we know how development occurs. We do it this way. We find a site. We determine highest and best use with economic inputs. Uh, we have zoning restrictions and so on. And we go through that process. We hire contractors. We do leases. And this is the whole uh, construct of how the built environment that we need, it's a fundamental human need, gets created. And surprisingly, I found that once upon a time, and it's going to be part of the story today, uh, that it was provided by various other people, but today, but for quite a long time now, it's been a commercial enterprise, a private commercial enterprise. And of course, some of them have done it well, but some of them have done it poorly. In order to take our young people who are interested in learning this profession, I therefore wanted to go back and see, well, how does someone do it the right way? And how, how where does someone screw up? And so when, when we really think about it, there, are, there isn't a clarity of the principles of process. Uh, in law, you have jurisprudence which essentially sets an intellectual framework, a philosophical framework, uh, even a moral framework about a law, its practice, its principles, and so on. We don't have that in real estate. Uh, we pull in a lot of things. We use uh, urban uh, theory. We use uh, economic analysis. Uh, we use aesthetic analysis and aesthetic creativity as all components of what uh, of the way in which we talk about and even approach development, but there's nothing essential that is about that whole composite process of developing the built environment by private enterprise. So this led me to look into where, how it began, what it was like where, when it began, why we do it this way, why, why do we do it this way? And furthermore, when you start to see it as a process, as a business model, you realize that this is taking over the world. Even in places like China, where it was state owned, they now engage with private enterprise to actually deliver the built environment as well. So even in, you know, it's not just capitalism, it's a whole, it's become a whole model that's being picked up and absorbed by all sorts of uh, you know, areas of governance and, and community. So I'll just start with the question, who builds our cities? And as I said, you know, originally it was the rulers. The rulers built cities. Then we had patrons and they built cities. They were still rulers and princes and so on. And we had kings. And we've had some great, great examples of cities and built environment developed by these people. However, do we see it happen today? No, no one does this. Uh, no government is as wealthy. No government uh, has such extensive uh, capability uh, or the, uh, the availability of resources. So therefore what happened? 
Capitalism and democracy changed that. And where I found the most explicit uh, presentation of this change, of this dramatic change from being provided by the kings, Paris being provided by the kings and so on, was London in the 16th and 17th, in its 16th and 17th century expansion. Here, instead of being very wealthy, like uh, the Italians and, the, uh, and even the French kings, uh, the royal family had relatively meager resources. Uh, England uh, was constantly at war in defending its, uh, its territory. And it was a very isolated country, not involved with trade. So there wasn't a substantial treasury. Uh, and so uh, the other thing was that the London city itself, and I'll get to that uh, in a minute, uh, London city had been founded by the Romans, you know, many hundred, 400 years BC, and it had stayed as an independent, relatively independent uh, form, Athens-like democracy and governance uh, through those centuries. That was reinforced during the 16th and 17th century as London and England became more prosperous. And the wealth was not the wealth of the kings, the wealth was the wealth of the city itself. So we had a city with governance and democracy and a relative amount of freedom. They certainly had enough not to uh, allow, uh, allow the, uh, the uh, royals to take over expanding their city. However, they also didn't have enough to really manage it on this grand scale of the de Medici's or of the French kings. So we had a little bit of a problem there as London uh, grew and uh, expanded in the 16th and 17th century. And we'll talk about the reasons, you know, what was behind that. Additionally, poor old London, plagues, plagues and plagues. You know, we've just been through COVID. Gee, you know, they had, they had them continually in those uh, centuries. There was a major one in 1665, uh, which uh, cleared out the city rather badly and, um, and then followed by the Great Fire of London in 1666. So these things were uh, a catastrophic accumulation of, of challenges for a city, London city, that was expanding at the heart of England's wealth during these centuries. And its built environment had to be created, uh, but there was no one with the, the resources or the power. So what actually happened was that we did find private property developers, private entrepreneurs, as entrepreneurship was being, um, was being encouraged in England, it had come from the continent and capitalism and entrepreneurship was, was arising. We had entrepreneurship applied to the creation of the built environment by private entities. And this was a very unusual story. It did not happen in the same way in Europe. Uh, we haven't quite seen it in other places. Um, I've researched a lot throughout. I'm, I know that China and Asia were very, very sophisticated in terms of ownership and development and so on, thousands of, you know, thousands of years before Europe, but I haven't yet seen a model that has survived and has become apparent. The thing about this model here is that this was the birth of the model we use today in the US and throughout, uh, throughout um, much of the world's uh, system, for better or for worse. So understanding it and seeing it's, you know, the things it does well and things it does poorly or the things that are, uh, are vulnerable in its process I think is critical to our ability to change things, not just wait until projects are completed and then criticize them or projects are proposed and then criticize them, but think about the process by which we even start to envision the creation of the built environment, by whom, with whom, with what resources and so on. So this is the story as, um, you know, as Carol said uh, about the, uh, the rising of this and it, it 
I really found that the first one that was substantial, uh, substantial enough to have impact in all sorts of ways, and I'll, I'll speak about that, uh, was created in, uh, it started in about 1628 and continued to be developed through that century uh, with various interruptions by civil war, fire, plague, and so on. But um, it became a, a, a model that really was recognized and then replicated through the 17th century um, in Bloomsbury and in, in Russell Square, if you've been there, uh, Southampton Square, St. James's Square, even Soho Square, Seven Dials, all of those are in the West End. But then in the following century, Georgian, the Georgian development, the, the expansion under the Georgian kings um, also picked up the same model. And we see Bath, and uh, all of the crescents and, and that sort of development. And of course, that was exported or used in the US by the, the very Anglo base for the American early development. Anyway, so the question is why then, what happened at that point that this, hap that, uh, this came to be? Certainly the first thing I said was there was a challenge. Um, however, for that challenge to be met in this way, there had to be various uh, pre-existing conditions, let's say, or context. And the first thing is that our, our Western European philosophy and so on, we must remember that unlike you know, many other philosophies about land ownership, property ownership, and so on, has specific understandings about the ownership and distribution of property to achieve a stable and good life for the community. Plato, for instance, said he was said to favor common ownership, um, but he said that everyone, you don't just get this common ownership for free, you had to actually labor on the land. You had to participate in its development, in its use, in its cultivation, and so on. Uh, Aristotle came up with a counter to that common ownership. He actually proposed that what is common to the greatest number actually gets uh, the least amount of care. And in fact, you know, there's a quote, which I even use in the book, where Larry Summers says, the economist, for, former uh, Treasury Secretary, says, has anyone ever washed a rental car? And that is pretty indicative of the fact that when something is common, when it's not yours, there tends to be a, a lack of caring for it as, as much as one should. Um, so there was a postulation by Aristotle that there'd be a better system if there were some privately owned uh, structure, but still he emphasized the importance of common use. Having private ownership didn't mean greed and self-satisfaction. Uh, it meant that you now had a responsibility to uh, use that resource or be, you know, uh, make use of that resource for the common benefit as well. Uh, in well-ordered cities, each citizen had their own property, but they had to make it available and, and so on. So there was a, a very important shading of our philosophy of property. And that of course went through all of European history, uh, Western European history from that early classical time and informed even the Renaissance and how we started thinking about uh, law and ownership and commerce um, in uh, later centuries. So an important thing therefore is for us, before we start you know, criticizing the notion of land and rights and so on, and you know, should this structure be, uh, be as it is, the, it's very important that, you know, if, if a philosopher named Summers said, and that's not Larry Summers, that's another one, it was not property that caused the political rights, it was the political culture of membership in a community that produced property. And property is picked up as an expression of community bonds and community networks and community arrangements. So this is, you know, this is where we can get in to understanding the development activity. The development activity as it currently is, is really a manifestation of things that we've already set up between us as humans within a community. So if we want to change that, then we, we can start by changing our notion of what our community arrangements are. 
um, as, as humans. And then we can modify the development process to reflect that change. Anyway, but going back to where it started, the competition of resources, of course, the reason why land, if you know, we're starting with the focus of land was because land was essentially um, used for survival in agrarian communities. You know, we're now talk, we talk about land now as an investment and so on and so on, but the key to it was that you, you didn't survive unless you had access to it, uh, you were able to cultivate it or uh, hunt animals on it and so on. However, over time, when communities actually formed around land and its, uh, and, and its ownership and its use, it beca also became a, a, power, a tool of power. And this, of course, has extended through to today and to our understanding of land and is at the root of inequality and maybe some of the destructive things we do to communities uh, with our development. The other thing, of course, is social symbolism. Uh, we have now used not just land, but also you know, the development of land, what you put on the land and create on the land uh, to be symbolic of what we are as social beings. The question that arises you know, is how does one get it? Um, for millennia, many civilizations, it was fought over, back and forth, battles, cost of lives. There was no other way. And you know, even today, we're seeing a similar sort of thing with respect to the Ukraine. Um, however, was that ever to change? Would we ever, you know, is, is diplomacy going to work with the Ukraine? That's a very good question because otherwise there's going to be lots of expenditure and cost and so on. So what actually happened in England, which was unusual for the rest of Europe, was that William the Conqueror came over from Normandy, 1066, invaded England, uh, well, what was in, in fact Britain, Anglo-Saxon Britain, uh, and he introduced an incredibly important change in governance and structure. Pre-William the Conqueror, uh, England, well, Britain was uh, the Britons and Celtics. Uh, it had, as I say, been at one time, in the 400 BC and you know, uh, around a couple of centuries around that time, it was a, a Roman outpost for trading. They did establish London. They based it on the city of London. They based it on so Roman social and legal structures for land use, ownership and control. That was very important that that was there and it, it survived uh, because it's going to feed into this overarching thing that happened with William the Conqueror. Um, there were successive raids for old Britain because it was, you know, it, it actually was very fertile. So it, it uh, was ver a very good place for uh, timber, um, lots of minerals, tin, uh, iron, and so on. So constantly uh, raided by the Vikings, the Angles, which is no part of northern Germany, and Saxons, also part of nor northern, uh, northern Europe. Um, and, um, and what arose was just a, a, an assemblage of various um, uh, communities and uh, small, small little kingdoms and a feudal style communities and so on. Uh, sorry, yeah, well, communities pre-feudal actually, um, because William the Conqueror had come from Europe uh, or from the continent where the feudal system had been the basic form of governance and uh, of, of the countries there for centuries. Uh, and however, when he arrived with, uh, in England, he established a variation upon that European feudal system. And the reason was this is not because he was, you know, I mean, he was a very bright man, obviously, but uh, he was up against uh, all of these kingdoms and, and uh, communities, well-structured communities in, Ang in the Anglo-Saxon model um, that were relatively independent and they weren't going to be totally uh, taken into the feudal system, which is really slavery or serfdom. Uh, so what happened was that he made a compromise with the feudal system and although he established big areas of ownership, which I'll discuss, he also made those ownerships, th that those lords 
enter into actual contracts with various members of the community that existed uh, there. Um, it wasn't always fair, for sure, uh, and these people lost a lot of what they might have had previously, but they weren't put into serfdom. They were actually treated as what we call the early form of tenant farmer. So this was quite, a, quite an interesting variation that occurred um, with William. However, in order to uh, manage this vast country, he basically took the part that was mostly England, uh, as we know today, uh, plus Wales, and sort of had to stop at the northern border because the Vikings were still uh, pretty much raiding uh, the, Scot the areas of Scotland. Uh, but what he did to control this, he realized that he had to take these 4,000 indigenous little kingdoms and pull them together under uh, 200 lords that he established, basically his friends and relatives and, and the various uh, people that had accompanied him on this um, invasion. Um, but he, he deliberately created a smaller cadre of rulers uh, in, in a form of administrative hierarchy. Uh, this enabled him to have closer control. What was remaining in Europe was a feudal system whereby there were some very small holdings by various uh, aristocrats and so on, some larger ones. And for any ruler of a country uh, to oversee some of those larger, as those uh, agglomeration of feudal uh, land, land holdings was very complex and messy. The, right. other, the other thing is that they also fought, right? So on the continent, constant battles back and forth between the smallholders, the big holders and everyone as to what their land holdings were. So if you wanted to take an extra foot or two, uh, you went in and stormed, the, stormed the, your neighbors and you know, took it and uh, if you were successful. William realized that this was very wasteful and uh, he knew it was going to be hard enough to defend the country as a whole. So he wanted to, uh, really uh, re remove this conflict within. So what he did was he, he said, this is the deal guys, you're the Lord of this land under my approval. Uh, you, you never really own it outright. It's never yours to do what you want with. You can't sell it. You can't give it up. You can't expand it. You can't use it for anything else than what we, what we decide. And from what you do with it, you have to pay me in taxes. And initially, of course, that was, you know, a few bushels of wheat or a sheep or two or whatever uh, they did with the land. They had to pay a portion in taxes. They also were committed to provide from their communities military resources. And most importantly, they had to be loyal. If they weren't loyal, the, the land was taken away from them back into the king's estate and given to someone else. So this was a whole new governance structure imposed across a vast area of, of very, very valuable land. Um, of course, you know, you don't just get up and say this is what's going to happen. He made sure that he established it uh, on record. And what they did was he had the whole country surveyed surveyed, you know, to, we think surveying is such a modern thing, but they surveyed it, they just described it, you know, in terms of streams and hills and, and so on, but it was all surveyed. And in the Domesday book, he, all of the estates were officially allocated and recorded the extent of them. Importantly, they weren't just described as acreage or, you know, sort of land, but they were described in what was called hides. And hides included the tax. So what William also did was not only define land in terms of its, its spatial definition, but he also put an economic value on it in terms of its tax obligation or a fiscal, uh, a fiscal uh, term on it. So this uh, established no interstate disputes. Uh, and frankly, you know, it was very, uh, it was backed up then again uh, a century and a bit later by the Magna Carta, which contained, which further clarified the 
authority and resources between the monarchs and the lords. Therefore, unlike the continent, and this is very important for the ability of development to occur in private enterprise, the land holdings remained stable for centuries. Uh, and they were understood and respected by all. Land leases were even formalized, you know, which was not happening on the continent. So there was a national definition that remained stable. Additionally, because of this, uh, this uh, modification of the feudal system and the, uh, the contractual arrangement between lords and uh, farmers, uh, there was a, 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 an illegal contract that arose called the lease. Um, and that really involved what we now, you know, what we use today, same thing, an annual payment of rent uh, for a given number of years. Often then it was for a lifetime. You didn't live too long then. So, you know, uh, up to 30 years or so on. Uh, it could be passed on to a son uh, through, through a lease, um, but the value to the tenant farmer was to meet their subsistence needs and pay a rent to the Lord. And that rent, once again, just like the tax that the Lord paid to the king, was in the form of, was in kind, either wheat or, you know, some produce or something. Of course, you know, the, the landholder had to fund, ch channel this through and give it to the monarch in taxes. So this went along very well um, until we started having a few little religious wars or religious arguments uh, in England for a variety of reasons. Um, and of course, because England was so, England's governance was so bound up in its, its understanding of land and its allocation of land and the contracts for land, that uh, once this started to happen, of course, we had uh, some commercial issues arising out of this. During Henry VIII's governance, uh, Henry needed a lot of revenues, very expensive wives and a, a number of them, but also constantly fighting with his relatives from the continent who were plotting to invade. Um, and, you know, this, this was everyone from the French through the, uh, through the uh, uh, Spanish and so on. Um, and so he needed a lot of, actually needed a lot of revenues to protect uh, the country and so on. He, he and his father, uh, typically in court, they take on to help them manage and administer the country, they take on other, the sons of other aristocrats and so on. You know, those, though they, with all the intermarrying, those were getting a little weak, weak minded. And uh, Henry VII and Henry VIII actually became a little bit more modern, as you would say, and hired according to capability or meritocracy. And so there turned up to be one particular person of that of note called Thomas Cromwell. Um, many people know him as a person who went up against Thomas More and was very much involved in religious wars. But um, his other life was his sort of critical life to Henry's, uh, to much of Henry's uh, rule was that he was the exchequer and he worked out how to raise significant revenues. He had actually interned over in the banking houses of Italy and, and what we what they call the low countries, which is the Netherlands. And this is where commerce had been thriving for a couple of centuries, as you know, uh, with the early Renaissance and so on. So um, uh, Cromwell found that, you know, in this battle with, uh, with the, uh, the church, the Roman church, um, England, much of England's land was underproductive. Uh, he had undertaken a survey. The church land at this time, the church that had been, uh, the, sorry, the land that had been denote, uh, uh, donated by various lords and other people, uh, you know, trying to get into heaven. Uh, so giving uh, land to religious organizations and so on, now amounted to be 20% of England. 20% of England's land was church occupied. And of course, they didn't pay any taxes to Henry. All of that, all of the uh, extra revenue they got went straight to the Roman church. So, um, you know, they were a little miffed at this and, um, uh, you know, as part of a larger context, of course. Um, and uh, there was a dissolution of the monasteries uh, over a period of time in which they went in and took over 
underutilized um, uh, monasteries and so on. Uh, now, the important thing for this was you'd say, all right, so, you know, church and state always battling. However, what happened here was that all of a sudden, you had, England had no trading of land, no movement of land. All of those estates from 1086 remained pretty much stable. Now, in the middle of the 16th century, you have 20% of the land changing hands, 20% of the land in play, taken back to the royal ownership, or so it was always royal ownership, but taken back under royal control. And what happened was that Thomas Cromwell said, I'm not going to just, we don't want to manage all this. We don't want to be dealing with farmers and tenant farmers. We are going to actually sell this off to people who can come up with capital, right? So now the big intent was cash. And he established the notion, the financial notion of what was the value of the land if you wanted to actually get some capital for it. And that's one of the big key things today that we have in real estate. How do we value a property? What will we pay for it? And the basic thing was taking this whole long time lease situation, two pounds a year for 30 years, meant that you would trade this piece of land for 60 pounds because the tenant farmers went with it, right? If you bought this land, the farmer was there, the contract was in place, and that, that contract was going to give you two pounds a year for the 30 years. So Cromwell, very interestingly, and, and land was not traded on the continent in this way at all. Uh, it was, it, there definitely was some buying and selling with respect to royal houses and so on, but it was done in, it, it's, uh, its calculation was not as uh, financially rigorous as this, for instance. And so uh, Cromwell really established this. And here even is his lease. He leased a piece of land and here's the survey of it. One of the first actual graphic surveys of uh, land uh, on a lease and he established all that. So having this actual financial detail and rigor for value, for definition of the, of the lot and so on was a, a real revolution for the possibility of land transactions. So therefore, these land transactions occurred through his, his um, Richard Cromwell and, uh, sorry, Thomas Cromwell, sorry. Uh, Richard Cromwell was his uh, nephew who, who fought later. But um, what Henry did was, here they are working in the office of the Exchequer. They did a lot of commercial work. And then upon Henry's death, as typical, uh, they were awarded with land grants. So we had two key people that we've tracked, um, and one is John Russell, and then the other is this fellow called Thomas Ridsley. And they had, uh, uh, Ridsley had actually worked with Cromwell. Uh, John Russell had been uh, part of the King's uh, circle, inner circle of, of uh, administrators, and uh, both of them received land grants. And titles, aristocratic titles. So John Russell became the first Earl of Bedford, Thomas Risley became the first Earl of Southampton. These were astute businessmen. Now they were including a uh, title, aristocratic title, which was in a system like the English system of land ownership was going to be very important to their ability to uh, be able to do interesting things with that land ownership. Um, importantly, these two gentlemen, who uh, were who lived in what was what is now called the West End of England? Uh, you know, you don't just sort of wait and see what the king hands out. You manipulate your, you know, you work through the court and get your put your eyes on what you want. And John Russell uh, had his eye on Covent Garden, and Thomas Risley had his eye on all of the area in Bloomsbury, as I'll show you later. So they got those land grants. And what happened was that we then moved into the prosperity of Elizabeth I. We had lots of uh, trading and court intrigue and so on. Um, but one thing that uh, happened was because of Elizabeth's trading, uh, the city of London just exploded because it was the major port. There were other ports obviously in England, but it was the major port. It was the major area of commerce. We have this Roman 
definition of the city, which is today the square mile, uh, surrounded by walls. That was where London was originally, but now it started exploding north, east, uh, south, even uh, across the Thames, and, um, and then most importantly, west. And the reason why the west was important is because the king or the monarch never resided in the city of London. The city of London remains to this day democratic. The Queen of England cannot enter the city without a formal invitation from the mayor of the city of London, cannot enter this square mile. So the monarchs, you know, they actually lived in various other places throughout England, but eventually got to locate in Westminster, which is over here on the west, uh, just at the bend of this river, bend of the Thames. So if you're going to be now working between business, the business of the city of London, and of course the power of the monarch, then being located in this inter interval area was going to be key. And in fact, even prior to this expansion, all of the, um, all of the various uh, religious leaders and so on and, and major nobles had established palaces along this bank of uh, the Thames between the city and Westminster. However, that was now we had a, a lot of pressure with even more expansion uh, of the city required. And this area was looking as obviously as a prime real estate for that development. Um, it was going to be beyond the city walls and this area was particularly important. And just to show you how uh, this was the 17th century, 1600, but just to show you how smart John Russell and, and Risley were, Risley took all of this area up here and Russell took all of this area here. So, you know, they were pretty astute. Uh, of course, one thing was that Russell lived here and Risley lived here. So they saw, uh, they saw that area as potential and, and claimed it. Uh, the House of Stuarts then, uh, so we've moved from Elizabethan times and the expansion of the city now into what happened in the 17th century. We have the introduction of the Stuart Kings and that, well, that rode the back, of course, the prosperity of England, uh, but also introduced a, a whole different approach. The Tudors had been relatively, uh, you know, you can say modest, but, you know, relatively low key in terms of uh, the built environment. The Stuarts, however, had been, um, you know, the con more continental branch of the family, and they uh, were now very much interested in the Renaissance, in getting London and England up to be competitive with the sophistication, the aesthetic sophistication of the continent. So we started with James I and Charles I and, and went through um, the others during that century. So looking at London's West End, as I say, these were, this was regarded just outside the city walls, regarded as the liberties. Uh, that's all from the uh, Magna Carta and so on. It was really un, you know, regarded as being a borough of a Middlesex, a bit like the Bronx. Um, so, but what happened was that there wasn't really too much administration of it. Uh, the city, it was outside of the city of London, so they didn't care too much. They didn't like, you know, too much development on their doorstep, but they couldn't do much about it. And the, the monarch that was down in Westminster really, you know, didn't have that detailed local control. So the administration was very light for the, you know, which provided for developers, as we know, will always rush in. You know, a power vacuum is a great opportunity for developers. So what we had was this area that was very prime for development. Additionally, and we all know uh, whether we're architects, engineers, real estate developers or whatever, that the lawyers involved, and particularly as I've spoken about England's land and its contracts, having the lawyers on hand and involved was key. And you know they, they actually located here in Lincoln's Inn, right on that Western edge, and this way, of course, they served both the city commercially and, and the monarch. 
so we have also that sort of intellectual um, uh, addition to what was potentially going to happen here. Um, we had lovely rural land and so on. It wasn't, get, it wasn't the same sort of crowded, congested city, city uh, that the city of London had become. Covent Garden, as I say, was, this is what it looked like, um, you know, prior, just at the start of that century. Uh, it was, uh, it was a religious uh, institution at the religious monastery over here. It was not called Convent uh, Garden. This is a, uh, a misname. Um, uh, it was actually called Covent Garden from a covenant. Uh, but it, there was a religious organization that owned it. And this was one of the ones that Henry VIII had taken back in his dissolution of the monasteries. And this is the one that John Russell, the first Earl of Bedford, uh, uh, obtained. Um, and, um, and so look at the location. You're coming along the Strand, which was a very busy uh, through way there even then, uh, between the city of London and to the Royal Court. Um, and so prime, prime area. So here's the Russells, they, you know, the, the granddaddy, John Russell, first Earl of Bedford, he had received the land grant back in Henry VIII's time, mid, mid 16th century. Of course, not much happened for a while, but eventually um, we had, when we had the, uh, the Stuart Kings come in, we had Francis Russell. And, you know, if you read the book, it's a, it's a torturous journey for this fellow to become the fourth Earl because he was really quite down in the uh, hierarchy. He wasn't one, a direct descendant, um, but the direct descendant didn't have any heirs. And then uh, his father actually had an older son who passed away and so on. So, but eventually Francis Russell, who was quite enterprising and very involved in um, the management of their estates. This is pre Covent Garden's plans. He actually became very involved in the planning. And he was the one who instigated the whole planning of Covent Garden. Uh, then he had a son, William, uh, William Russell, who became the Earl of Bedford. And then I will show you that eventually the, this family married to the Rithersleys and the whole thing became the Bedford estate. Um, but as I say, you know, the fourth Earl and I, you know, I, I really propose that he was, this was drafted, it has the Earl of Bedford's uh, signature, um, whether he had such fine penmanship, we don't know whether he had someone uh, doing this, but this was definitely uh, pre any professional involvement. This is how he considered setting out Covent Garden. And you can see that, you know, here they were now educated. They just didn't build streets with a row of houses, but they were interested in this common, this garden area, uh, an open plaza uh, and so on, which was very unusual. You certainly didn't see it uh, in typical uh, urban, urban evolving areas in England. Uh, however, if he, he had his focus on um, aristocratic residents, uh, he knew that uh, he, he knew these people well, and he knew that he would have to provide some sort of attractive amenity for them for their city dwelling, for the time that they were dwelling in the city. Yeah, he had good ideas, but what we did have, as I say, is um, uh, the Stuart Kings, James I um, hired a fellow named Inigo Jones, who had started out, um, there wasn't such a thing as architecture training, he had started out as an artist. He'd gone abroad to Florence, particularly, uh, done a lot of sketching and particularly being involved in establishing the sets of masks, which were plays. And he came, he came back to England and was hired as the King's Surveyor. Um, interestingly, he, of course, was now steeped in the, all the classical things that were happening on the continent, such as in Florence. This is Leishon Piazza. Uh, where building was put, was set around the outside of a public piazza. He, he knew Paris. This is the Royal Plaza in Paris, uh, where once again, you had buildings surrounding a courtyard. And of course, he proposed for Covent Garden, a piazza, an open piazza 
with the housing and the development around the outside. So he obviously, you know, that uh, he had a, a very strong hand in this because this was a major development. And even back then, the Earl of Bedford, as I said, you may be an aristocrat with land title, but you couldn't do anything with it unless you got the king's, the, the monarch's permission. So Bedford had to go to the monarch and say, I want to develop this. And the king at this time, James said, well, you better have uh, Inigo Jones involved. And Jones was very much involved in the actual planning of not just the site, but also the buildings. And as we will see, uh, he was also on site doing, measuring the work and, and noting all the work. This is his signature, his, uh, sorry, not his handwriting, uh, 1629 of a part of the garden on uh, Covent, Covent, um, the Covent Garden development. With respect to the building design, wonderful you know, use of Palladio, um, brought, had brought that over, knew the proportions, knew the, the classical orders and so on. Uh, this is, a house called Leighton House, which was survived today, which is attributed to him or his office. But most importantly, this is what he came up with for Covent Garden. So, you know, perfectly neoclassical um, and so unseen in England. England had not seen this sort of architecture at all. This was totally new. So he developed this and built out uh, these buildings around uh, the outside uh, perimeter of this piazza. The piazza continued to function as a market, very important for community life throughout uh, England and the world uh, and Europe at that time. Uh, and that was a very important thing. Community life continued to be part of the piazza. We have Hogarth's painting uh, later on. And, you know, you know, um, you know about um, Pygmalion and, you know, all of the things that happen in Covent Garden. However, most critically, not just the buildings, but most importantly, the development of Covent Garden was about the amenities. It wasn't a building. It was a collection or an arrangement of amenities. As I said, starting with the piazza and making that open and public, uh, additionally, connecting, and you know, the private developer then had to build out all the streets. There wasn't a Department of Transport to come in. They had to build out all of these streets, and he made them good quality streets linking to the major thoroughfares. Here it is linking to the Strand down here. So creating all of these, and this is actually where Bedford had his own house. So he put his own house here, and that's another important thing. These early developers lived on their developments. And that was a very important part of their uh, in engagement with the community and their sense of responsibility to the community and to the way in which the development uh, was cared for over time. So Bedford lived there. Additionally, of course, um, London was becoming very crowded. The parishes were growing uh, extensively. There was no room. And what really clinched the deal for Bedford to get approval, he was knocked back a couple of times, but eventually he was approached by the church of, in London and they said, who was looking over the parishes, and they said, if you build us a new parish church, we'll agree to the plans. So they, he built this beautiful St. Paul's um, parish church, which once again, near, uh, fabulous continental neoclassical architecture. This was in the Tuscan style, and uh, but a very beautiful form of the Tuscan style. It continues to exist. All of this stuff up here on the top is nonsense, but that happens with drawings. Uh, but it was uh, in this Tuscan style, which was an unusual order for an architect to use. However, uh, Inigo Jones felt that this was most useful for the sort of lower key notion of English, the English built form. And so he did this. Um, of course, the developer had to fund all this. The developer funded the building of this. Uh, the operate, the in fact has uh, given uh, the rent roll 
of a couple of buildings to the uh, upkeep of the uh, church and the piazza. Um, but, you know, uh, as a developer, Earl of Bedford was no fool. And he said, my goodness, now I've got to build a church. And, you know, he said to Inigo Jones, you know, please, just a shed, just a shed, and, or barn, actually. And, um, and Inigo Jones is reputed to have said, you will have the most beautiful barn ever created. So, and yes, he was right. It was a beautiful church. So that's Covent Garden and sorry, just to go back to its arrangement, as you can see, the important thing was it wasn't just a singular building, but in fact was an arrangement of within a community and within, you know, of built form interacting with each other. Not only were there wealthy residents around the piazza, but he also had other areas that were, uh, cottages for uh, lower income groups. So he actually created a mix of residents in the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, and, and that was a very important way of continuing to build a part of the urban fabric that really did settle into London and was very successful. Um, the model, of course, was, as I mentioned, was picked up by uh, the, uh, the Ridsley family, uh, who became the Earl of Southampton. Uh, one just note in passing, a little titillation that uh, I don't go into in detail it much in the book, but the third Earl of Southampton, here he is here, beautiful young man, evidently was a major muse, if not love interest, of Shakespeare, and to him, the third Earl of Southampton are the only dedicated literary works of Shakespeare, and those are the two love sonnets. So our real estate developers, you know, they, they were in there and, and culturally involved. Um, additionally, he was one of the earliest investors uh, in uh, what was called the London Company, which came out and settled Virginia. So uh, obviously the model uh, was ingrained in the family and, um, and, uh, and was exported to the US even through that private ownership. His, uh, his son, uh, he grew up and had a long life, in, was in the tower for a while, but he had a son which was the fourth Earl of Southampton and the fourth Earl really, even though the third Earl got it started, the fourth Earl really built out this fabulous area they have up here. So here's the Holborn, and they had all of this acreage north of the Holborn. Um, what, what had been happening in England, of course, was this, uh, the illness because of the overcrowding and the plagues. And here were medicos at that time were even saying fresh air, open place and so on, um, you know, go, go out to live there. So that, that benefited his development. And then the great fire, swept through the city of London. This area was untouched. So it became a big area of development after the Great Fire. And here is the first of the squares that he developed on the same model. This is uh, the Southampton or what was called Bloomsbury Square at that time, now called Southampton Square. Um, but similarly, they owned all the land around, uh, including um, Russell Square and all of that. So he developed that. Um, we had the uh, Bedford family on one side, and then we had the Southampton family. And of course, as we all know in real estate, it's all interconnected and usually uh, amalgamated and often amalgamated through marriage. So we had Rachel Rithersley because the fourth Earl didn't have any sons. He wisely set up land trusts. Rachel took her land trust, which was all of that Bloomsbury area, married the son of William Russell and together they formed the House of Bedford that continues to this day. Uh, this was the development. This is, this is some of the work that was done at that time that is still there today in fine condition. Patrice, uh, I, I just want to mention we're, we're just after seven o'clock. Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Right. Here we are. We're at now at Jamie. And so here we have today, we have Jamie and... Okay, uh, yeah. The new coming I'll just to introduce a few comments. Thank you, Patrice. It's fascinating. Uh, but just five images quickly to talk about or show what are, in a way, contemporary landed estates. So no longer uh, Earl of Bedford or Risley, but in this case, uh, Covent Garden as owned by Capital and Counties. 
a, a stock company which uh, owns the whole estate. And so what they've done is to continue on in a way in a tradition of balancing public and private. Uh, the developer, Ian Hawksworth, is responsible for putting paving stones, cobblestones on the street, on the public zone, in the square. In return, he gets uh, a, the ability to add some pieces uh, to, to the whole and also just to increase the value, which has gone up at least 50% in the retail zones. So there's a sort of a, a modern version in a way of noblesse oblige or of uh, developer benefiting from helping the public. So the tourist destination here is enhanced by the, the sort of the spending uh, in the public realm. So that's that's one example. And, and we're working on actually 13 little projects depicted here of, of sort of micro uh, improvements of courtyards and bridges and so on. Let's move to the next image very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, another sort of landed estate, you could say, uh, the same developer, Ian Hawksworth, who runs Capital Counties, used to run the development for Hong Kong land. And in Central, this is the area that was amassed by Jardine, so a, a Scottish trading house, ultimately was a family, Keswick family. And you could see a whole series of buildings that are connected. So the, the, the kind of mechanic of the dynamic here is that public rights of way, of bridges, of internal atria, of walkways are mandated by public, by the city of Hong Kong, or now special, special administrative region, um, no longer the colony, but um, in return for extra floor area in the buildings. The whole thing is a kind of network of public walkways and public amenities. So benefiting public, benefiting private to a huge degree as well. Next, please. So that's Hong Kong. And then uh, we all know Rockefeller Center, won't go too deeply into this, but uh, one of, of, of course, America's great uh, leading industrial uh, uh, sources of, of uh, of uh, universities, Chicago, Rockville University, but also of great pieces of town, we know Rock Center, as a place where public uh, f uh, space of public character of the skating rink uh, uh, and also some rights of way going through uh, mid block are balancing again, public and private. Uh, and you could say there is some sense of responsibility here quite a bit in the design of the place, much like uh, Covent Garden, this is a, a place of coordinated architectural motif, proportion, et cetera. There's a great beauty and sense of well-being in the consistency of, uh, of this great development. Next, please. And the third out of the five is uh, something totally different. Uh, Roppongi Hills in Tokyo, uh, an amassing of uh, properties that belong to some over 300 residential owners before uh, this idea of pulling them all together happened uh, over a period of 10 or 15 years. And uh, within this mixed use project, and it looks a bit chaotic here, it's actually very pleasant when you're there, but uh, our public spaces that are part then of the community. Interestingly, Mr. Mori's family uh, in the uh, southern part of Japan in Kyushu had estates of a kind of a samurai period, Tokugawa period. Uh, but here in uh, Minotaku, they had a detached property of their uh, uh, landed uh, ownership from uh, hundreds of years ago, which now uh, today is this private development, but again, with public access and all the owners of property in the community either were given apartments in the buildings or paid for their land. So it was an interesting kind of deal, if you will, that was hatched over, over 20 years or so. Next, please. And then finally, a project, these are all projects that we've been working on over the past 15 years, uh, is a newer project for Google. So, you know, one of the highest uh, capitalized companies in, in our country or in the world uh, is building a town or within the city of San Jose. Uh, and so uh, a number of architects, including ourselves, working on the buildings and the master plan, but the, the sort of public-private balance uh, accommodates for or requires 25% um, affordable housing, uh, over 5,000 prevailing wage construction jobs, 15 acres of public parks, and uh, long-term uh, assistance for, for those in need. So it, it's today's version, uh, if you will, of a kind of ducal estate, 
And although we don't have so much time left, it's interesting to reflect on these examples. And I, and I think to see the relevance of what Patrice talked about as uh, taking shape and being given form and legal structure in London uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, the foundation still is in our minds. And maybe a question to leave us with, I don't know how long, Carol, we wanna go on, it's 7.10, but maybe a question uh, for you, Patrice, to, to, to talk about is, um, you know, in the very beginning, I read a paragraph that was quite damning about uh, the, the private development industry, and that wasn't meant to be a, 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 a summation. It's just the first kind no, of provocation, let's say, of your book, and the rest goes into, I think, a very balanced point of view, both critical and, and not. But I think we certainly have lived through periods, um, 1950s, parts of the 1960s, when the uh, private investment in city building uh, seemed to be quite detached from the common good, from the sort of forces of the market that answered to the needs of, uh, of people who lived and work in our cities. So, you know, big developments by Prudential Insurance, you know, big, big Levittowns. Um, of course, there was something to be said for creating places for people to work and roofs over their heads. But I think we would say today that the the, if we call it the profession of, of development, I'm not sure it's a profession, but maybe we could say it is, that, that, uh, that there was a more enlightened view of the balance between public and private, between the market and the, the common good, or the connection between the market and common good. And so, you know, there you are running a very important program at Columbia that, that, that talks about these subjects in current day practice. Um, uh, we don't have time maybe to go into a long discussion about it, but do, do you find when you're teaching your students uh, contemporary models for this uh, connecting of public good with uh, private enrichment, which has driven the kind of historical examples that you've shown earlier? Um. Uh, you know, the absolutely we, you know, we still have, a, you know, that wasn't the end of the story in England, of course, some, some, uh, you know, developers, rather rapacious developers picked up the model and were less interested in the community, they, the key was they didn't live in the community or continue to live. Uh, they took land, flipped it basically developed and flipped and so on. So there, you know, there will always be, there, there was at the out, almost at the outset that approach, that extraction uh, from the community. Um, but uh, what we see is that we are uh, increasing the interest, even if it's being forced on developers, the sensible ones will know that economic value is the community, right? You are not removed from the community. It's not you know, it's not a contest. Um, the survival, the economic uh, uh, success of your project is, is integrated with the success of the community. So there's no point in, in uh, separating those. The, a key thing is that what happens with a real, um, with a really integrated development is that the community is involved in, its, in expressing its own aspirations, its own concerns, its own needs, ahead of just being uh, negotiated into the acceptance of you know, various sort of benefits or gifts. And that's what was important about this early one, in that um, you know, the Earl of Bedford was there amongst the community and knew what, what these people wanted, how they wanted to live and so on. Uh, so, so that's an important thing. We do see it today in terms of some uh, developers trying to do, we see uh, some municipalities trying to enforce it by either having a community offering, uh, com uh, imposing community charges and so on. Um, that tends to uh, be dislocated often from the project itself. We even see the problem with affordable housing uh, components being shifted away from developments on Billionaires Row and so on. So, you know, there are, there are uh, we certainly students today still seem, still see the same uh, landscape of people understanding it and looking into the future and to the benefit uh, versus those that don't. And when Patrice, was there even now coming going back to Earl Bedford and, and the inception of Covent Garden, was 
you talk a little bit about about some uh, aspects of of the work done by the developer of of uh, requirements uh, laid out by the crown. But do, do could we call that regulation? Could we yeah. call it zoning? Could we call it? I think through your book, you you sort of follow some of the trail of the inception of the first roots of what we think of today as as zoning. Yeah, and I. Think so that's fascinating to, to chronicle that and see the, the kind of evolution into what we are very familiar with today. It's a really sophisticated set of tools to bring together public, private, and, and, and the, the aesthetic realm too of, of uh, the whole making of cities. Yes, and that was very important in the evolution. Uh, initially, it was just a ban on any more building. Uh, Queen Elizabeth had numerous pro pro proclamations saying you just cannot build anything anywhere near anything. So, you know, our modern day um, NIMBY or banana. Uh, but um, what happened was with the stewards, they did want to see building occur. And they, they came up with this where Inigo Jones was so critical. Inigo Jones was the first English born architect in England. And he was the first person to come and do, well, really the most notable person to come and do the neoclassical. And he was the first person to say, we can let them develop. We can be part of development. We are going to not just restrict, we're going to help modify how it's done and provide standards, which was you know, the beginning of zoning. Basically, you can only go so high, you have to have a right. certain aesthetic quality and so on. So you know, very important that these things grew up. So right at the beginning, there was uh, an, a, a, an absolute interweaving between not just you know the development of the community but also the governance, the political connection. And today you know we decry the fact that politicians, our mayors and so on get so, so much in terms of real estate support and funding and so on. The real estate you know probably provides 70 percent of a municipal budget, real estate taxes and so on. Right. So you know municipalities depend upon development. And development depends upon municipalities. And that has been there since the beginning. The key thing is to, I think, to develop a way of working that's not contested, but actually, you know, how do we come together? And, and as Indigo Jones did with the Earl of Bedford, created this architecturally progressive uh, and, uh, you know, and beautiful environment that was also incredibly commercially successful through 400 years. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I think the discussions in your book also, which uh, occupy a greater part of the book as you move towards the end, uh, it's questions of density, of the limits of density are ones that perhaps the Earl of Bedford didn't face, certainly in the same way that we do. And uh, this question of uh, the prosperity of our society and that we all benefit if the sea is rising and all the boats go up and, and uh, at the same time, uh, we all lose to some degree uh, if there are uh, if we're deprived of light and air, or if our transport systems are too crowded. Uh, I think those those topics again we don't have time for today, but certainly for the skyscraper museum, they're very very relevant. Limits or advantages to density, and the the context of your book and the, and the history of this all to give us some pointers uh, about how we should should regard these topics. And they're really, I think, totally alive today on the cover of your book, you know, one of the buildings in East Midtown, uh, big big question as, as to whether we're really stimulating, as, as I, I believe we are, a, a kind of a renaissance of that part of town, but, but how to balance, again, um, the sort of, as I would see it, the three circles, the Venn diagram, um, the public, the private investment, uh, and and uh, the aesthetic realm, or or the the the, the well being of the space that you make. Mm. So um, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's really. I was so fascinated to read. Sort of to go back to the roots again. What did Plato say about development? But you know, when I thought you first mentioned the philosophy of development, I thought it was a joke. But it's not because fundamentally, land rights are mm. are something having to do with basic human instincts and you know, life and death and everything in between. And I think there are many lessons in your book that are, I think are, are great to carry for today and, and kind of revisit our contemporary problems with that with those perspectives. Thank you. And, you know, with the caveat that this is one way of looking at the world and one way in which 
you know, our structure is not the same as the American Indian or the indigenous Australian Ab Aborigine and so on. So, but this is within a context and understanding our context and how we work within it, I think is the key to improving it. So thank you very much, Jamie. Thank you, Carol. Well, thanks to you both. Thanks so much, Patrice, for that um, incredible sweeping history that you gave us. And Jamie, thanks for framing it and bringing us back into the present as we all, you know, the our ever present focus on the present, uh, I think is all the better informed by the history. And in the sense of the Anglophilia of this evening, I think I, I might put a twist on uh, Winston Churchill who said famously, uh, we, we, we shape our buildings and they shape us. But even more fundamental than that is the, the way that land shapes us and our society. And you've shown us how in the case of, um, of, of England, as it's created as England, the, the fundamentals of, of making a system of land and value changed our cities, changed society, changed us, and changes the way that we think about development in other places as Jamie builds in Shanghai or, um, or any Chinese city or back or, you know, around Rockefeller Center or, or back to Covent Garden. We have, um, we have, we have come in a, in a circle of, of life and land, I guess. Yeah. So th thank you both so much for being with us tonight and ex exposing all of these in incredibly rich ideas. And again, um, congratulations on the book, Patrice. It's a, a wonderful um, accomplishment. And uh, I, I direct um, our, um, our, 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 our viewers um, to the author and the the, the textbook quality, unfortunately, the textbook prices um, of <laughs> Rutledge, but um, yeah, you got, um, tonight's, uh, tonight's content for free and um, watch it again on YouTube. There's, there's, there's much to learn from, um, uh, from, from all of this tonight. So thank you both again.